Right, I'm going to be speaking today on how Jesus trained ministries. Just going to read one little verse that you know pretty well, although you won't know it in this version because this is the GBM version. <laughs> Matthew chapter 28 and verse 19. Jesus speaking to his disciples said, Because of this you should go out and disciple all nations baptizing them into the name, which is the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Today, the in thing, if you want to be trained to fulfill your ministry calling, is to find the mentor. People come to us, enroll in our schools, and we ask them, do you want a mentor? And usually they say, yes, we want a mentor. Now, while education plays a very important part in our training, um, it takes more than simple knowledge to learn how to minister. You need another person to show you the ropes and to help you succeed. And I think that's what most people think of when they realize that I need a mentor, somebody who can work with me and help me reach that goal. But I'm afraid very few people understand what a mentor really is. <laughs> uh, and if I were to ask those who have a mentor, how long have you been with your mentor? I may get anything like a couple of years. Quite a long time I've been looking to this person to mentor me. Okay, now that answer immediately tells me you don't have a mentor <laughs> because that's not what mentorship is. Okay, we have this limited thinking that we need a mentor who is going to take us to where we should be. But actually, it takes a lot more than a mentor to train you, especially if God's called you to a higher level ministry. Okay, now... A lot of folks don't know this. You can have many different mentors during your lifetime. And a mentorship relationship is always temporary. It's never an ongoing relationship. It's always temporary. It only has a fixed period of time and then it's over. Now, the best model that we can find of training is given to us by the Lord himself. We see in the life and the ministry of Jesus the best model or picture of how people should be trained for ministry. And I'd like to speak about this in some detail today and we'll understand from the way Jesus trained his disciples. We'll look at what I believe is the more scriptural way of training. Okay? Uh, incidentally, Jesus did not promote mentoring. <laughs> You won't find that word. He recommended a process called discipling, which is not the same thing. Okay? And he recommended discipling for all kinds of training. Okay? We saw the scripture at the beginning. He told every believer to go and make disciples of the nations. That means even from the point of bringing somebody to the Lord, as a young believer, discipleship starts there. But discipleship doesn't stay there. The principle of discipleship moves all the way up the line, even right up to the highest ministries in the fivefold and in the offices. Now, I'd like to look at the training process very quickly. For those who will go through our apostolic school, I have a course called the seven functions of apostolic leadership. That's because the apostle is the ultimate trainer. And there I mention seven activities that are carried out in the process of training. It's quite a big course. It was so big I actually even split it into two pieces at one stage. And I'm going to give it to you in two minutes. <laughs> I'm going to tell you very quickly what the seven... Because these are seven ways of training. 
Okay. The first one and the very lowest one is mentoring. Out of the seven, it's the lowest one of all. What is a mentor? A mentor is somebody who develops only one specific quality in a person. And that's why it's temporary. And once that quality has been trained and developed, their time is up and they move off. Okay? If you've had a mentor for an extended period, they have probably failed to mentor you. <laughs> or they don't even know what mentoring is. So dump your old mentors, please. They're no good. The second one is, uh, sorry, not discipling. The second one is coaching. Coaching. You know what a coach is? These days, life coaches are the in thing. Go and find a life coach who will help you to find your purpose in life and reach your goals. Now, a coach has one basic approach. Their approach is to help you to discover in yourself your own resources and capabilities and what you really want to do. The coach never advises you or tells you what to do. They ask you questions and prompt you. They never put pressure on you. You know, we kind of got it mixed up when we look at coaching like in sports where the coach pushes you beyond your limit, <laughs> makes you run that extra. Now, that's not what true coaching, what life coaching is about. These coaches, they never push you or even advise you. They simply make you think and tap into your own resources. And hopefully within your own resources, you will find the answer. Okay. It's a very low level function. Kind of like mentoring. It's not that big a deal, but it has its place. Because sometimes people are not ready for somebody to come as a trainer and say, bam, bam, bam. <laughs> this must change, this must change, you got to do that. Uh, hey, hang, on, hang on, hang on, hang on, I'm not ready for that. Okay, so we start by mentoring, which is basically teaching. Simple teaching, practical stuff. And we come to coaching to help you feel good about yourself and to feel comfortable with moving further. Okay. And then we come to the third one, which is discipling. Now, here's the difference between mentoring and discipling. A mentor builds into you only one quality. So, for example, if you wanted to learn to pray better, you could find somebody who has a good, strong prayer ability and say, please mentor me on how to pray. And they will spend a time with you teaching you the principles and showing you how to pray effectively. And once you've developed that quality, they're no longer needed and the time must come to an end. Sometimes we try to hold on to our mentor and the Lord has to sometimes cause a fight to bring a division because you've got to let him go. Okay. Discipling, on the other hand, is the person is going to pour into you everything that they have. Not just one quality, but all of them. The discipler and the, 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 the concept in scripture is the master disciple. Now, we, we have difficulty with this word master today. I don't have a master. Only the Lord is my master. See, uh, that, that word master is also translated teacher. And you'll say, you see very often the disciples turn to Jesus and they call him either teacher or master. Okay? In Eastern culture, they still use that. Mm. Star Wars. The master and the Jedi Knight, you know. <laughs> okay. That concept is still there. It's a discipling process where the master puts everything that they have into the disciple. Now, there's only one problem with this. Jesus said that the disciple can never be above the master. In other words, you can rise no higher than what your master is. If God's called you to something higher, you're stuck. So you don't even hang on to your master. The mentor's even lower, the master's slightly higher, but there still has to come a time. Unless you're quite happy to be there. I'll submit to my pastor to become a member of the church. What do you want me to do, pastor? Yes, pastor. No, pastor. Okay, pastor. I will just be the nice, happy little member fitting in with whatever the pastor's vision is. 
See, there, there is a time and a place for that, but usually if God's called you to something higher, that's going to come to an end. Because the Lord has more to you, for you than that. Okay, the fourth function of, of training is counseling. And uh, this is something a lot of people don't understand because counseling is not giving advice. <laughs> counseling is actually giving clear direction based on the scriptures. Okay? When somebody comes for counsel, uh, you have to first de- tell them where they missed it, <laughs> tell them what they did wrong, and tell them what they need to do to fix it. You have to actually turn their whole life around and change their entire character and, and, and the habits of their life. It's quite a deep, it's quite a deep process, uh, and it involves a, 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 an intense job of sometimes digging deep to find out all the things that in, in you that need to be addressed. Okay. Can you see we're getting higher as we go? The fifth one is teaching, and this is proper structured teaching. Kind of thing that you get when you go through a full training course that leads specifically up to a qualification. Okay, this is high-level teaching. And the apostolic teacher teaches based on experience, not just theory. And then the sixth one is managing. Sometimes we confuse leadership and management. See, a leader is quite simply somebody who has a following. Are you a leader? Well, very easy to find out. Turn around and see if anybody's following you. If nobody's following you, you're not a leader. Yeah, but I'm going places. Nobody's following. You're not a leader. Okay. A manager is more than a leader because a manager actually gets integrally involved in the lives of those who are following and actually puts them in their place. The manager says, you are better at that job. I'm giving you that task to do. You are better at something else. I'm putting you there. I'm structuring you and I'm showing you exactly where you should go. There's no guesswork here. There's no, I wonder if I should do this or I should do that. The manager is the expert who knows where you fit best. And you're going to be trained, your trainer, if they are going to truly function as a trainer, they're not just going to give you a whole lot of principles and say, there you go, go and do your ministry. They're going to be very specific and say, you need to be doing this ministry. You need to be doing that. And they're going to put you in your place. And then the final level is parenting. Spiritual parenting at the highest level, apostolic parenting. What happens with parenting? Now, The master trainer pours all the knowledge and ability into the disciple until the disciple knows as much as them. A spiritual parent gives far more than that. Because you see, we have within us a kind of a spiritual DNA. We all understand physical DNA. But do you know there's psychological DNA and there's spiritual DNA? You see, You've given your children your physical DNA. Sooner or later, you'll find out. I remember sitting once talking, looking at our kids and saying, now, whose nose does she have and whose ears does she have? Now, she's definitely got your mouth. But, 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 but you know, she, 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 she's got my ears. Isn't it amazing how, 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 how the child's kind of a mix of the parents? You can often see exactly what they got. But that's all physical DNA, you see. There's deeper DNA than that. And if you are going to rise up beyond just physical generation into the spiritual, a spiritual parent will impart to you their spiritual DNA. And if you receive that, well, time's going to come when you're going to look just like them spiritually. Chances are people may even wonder whether you are really related to that person because you're just so like them. You have the same heart, the same motivation, the same spirit. See, that comes naturally. You don't have to force your children to be like you, to look like you. It just came naturally. And in the same way with spiritual DNA, you don't have to keep telling everybody, look, it's time you start getting my DNA. <laughs> It's a big subject. I taught a lot on it once and I made a few mistakes expecting all my spiritual children to have my DNA and they kept taking other people's DNA. It was quite frustrating. But we won't go into that now. 
Spiritual parent gives you more. They give you a spiritual DNA. And an apostolic parent goes even further that they can actually birth a ministry into you that you didn't have. Okay. That's by the by. That's not my main message here. Okay. But if you're really keen on this, go. Those of us who are partners with us, you can go into GBM books and you can read the seven functions of apostolic calling. They're there. Okay. And you can you can read in quite a lot of detail because I've given very detailed teaching on these. Okay, now some of these training ways can be done at all different levels, starting right even from a young believer. Okay. But you can only give people what you already have. So if you are at a pretty low level yourself, you can't disciple anybody to the higher levels. You can only disciple them to the level that you are. Okay? So the higher up you go, the more you have to give and the more capable you are going to become as a trainer. And that's why the ultimate trainer is the apostle who sits right at the top. And that's why I've taught these as the seven functions of apostolic leadership. Apostles are the greatest trainers. Now we need a balance when we come to training people. There's a time to be gentle, a time to motivate them, and there's a time to apply pressure. You know, that word disciple comes from our English word discipline. It's a word we don't like, discipline. <laughs> it involves pressure, okay? But there must be a clear goal. Where are we going? Where are we headed? What are we aiming for? year. And what price do you need to pay to get there? What's it going to take to qualify to reach that level of ministry? Oh, you know, the Lord's called me to be an apostle. A prophet prophesied over and he says, thus says the Lord, I have called you to be my apostle. Young 25-year-old guy, he wants to go and study and become an apostle. He doesn't even have any ministry experience yet. <laughs> and he goes, yeah, bam, hits the wall. What happened? Doesn't come by calling. Calling only gives you a goal and a direction to aim for. You're going to have to go through the training levels, and there's quite a lot of level. The higher you want to go, the longer it's going to take, the more it's going to involve. Okay. So you must know what is it going to take, and how do I qualify in this training? And then. Have you ever done a training course, whether it be at school or at varsity, at college, where they just give you the lectures and say, okay, you're qualified? I wish. It's the tests. All oh, those tests. And if, you've got to, if you fail the test, you don't qualify. Spiritual training, ministry training is exactly the same. There will be tests that you will have to pass before you can qualify. Okay? Let's see how Jesus did it. Firstly, Jesus displayed his ministry. Okay? He presented what he had to the public, to a very large group of people. He stood up boldly, and he showed what he had to offer. He didn't apologize for his presence. Okay? He didn't try to conform to get people to accept him and to follow him. He presented who he was and what he had boldly and confidently to a large group of people. And different people reacted to that in different ways. Some of them rejected him outright, especially the Pharisees. He was a challenge to them. He was cutting across the way they'd been doing it for years. And they were supposed to be the hotshot leaders. And now here he comes with a whole new approach. He's making us look stupid. We can't allow this. God's called you to rise up into high-level ministry. You're going to have the spiritual Pharisees of today who have been running the church and controlling it and being the big-name hotshots. They're not going to like it. They're going to say, you, 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 you're going your own way now. You, you must learn submission. You must learn to do it our way. Well, Jesus didn't do it their way. He did it God's way. You want to rise up into higher leadership, get ready for opposition. It's coming. 
It's coming. But you know, I wanted to be popular. I wanted to be famous. I wanted everybody to recognize me, this great big up and coming ministry. And people are preaching against me. They're writing books against me. Ooh, welcome to the club. Uh, you definitely have a calling. <laughs> You're just like Jesus. Now, Jesus had those who opposed him, but there were some who hung on to his every word. Wow. We've never heard this kind of stuff before. Oh, we want more. We want more. Now, let me tell you something. Jesus didn't once try to win over those who were against him. He didn't ever try and persuade them. Hey, look, look, guys, you, you need, if you just understood what I was doing, maybe, you, maybe, you'll, maybe you'll join me and support me. No. He didn't waste his time doing that. Okay. Jesus did not need to be recognized by the big names. He was this little Johnny come lately, came out of nowhere, Nazareth. Crappy little city, Nazareth. Huh. And he wants to stand up here and be a big preacher. They'll look down their noses at him. <laughs> Jesus wasn't looking for recognition from the big names. He didn't care what they thought about him. And he didn't once compromise in any way to get them to accept him or to get them to recognize him. If you still need people to accept you and recognize you, if you need your name to be out there in lights, where you would say, oh, have you heard from this guy? Man, he's such a great man of God. She's such a great woman of God. Yeah. If you want to follow Jesus pattern, chances are you're going to have people oppose you. and They're not going to like what you're doing because it cuts across what they've been doing. And if God's called you to move into what he's doing in his church today, there's a large group of believers, <laughs> which I like to call the status quo church, who will take pleasure in stabbing you in the back and making sure that you fail. Well, are you going to be like Jesus? Or are you going to be like one of them? You can be like one of them and join their club. And you may be even put on the Sanhedrin <laughs> and get a name for yourself. Or you could face the possibility of getting crucified. Which one will you take? Jesus offered everything he had to those who followed him. He didn't show any favoritism in any way. All he needed from them was a desire to learn and receive. And to have confidence in him without questioning everything he did. It's all he needed from them, nothing more. And if they were prepared to do that, he gave them everything. He withheld nothing. Okay. But from amongst those who began to follow him as a result of the presentation of his public ministry, from among them, Jesus chose a specific group of followers to be his close disciples. In Mark 3, in verse 13, it says, And he went up into a mountain and called to him those whom he wanted. And they came to him. And he appointed twelve so that they could be with him and so that he could send them out to preach. Now things were beginning to change. This wasn't the group. This was a unique, select, elite group that Jesus selected from amongst all of those followers. Now, how did Jesus choose his disciples? Firstly, he didn't put out an ad. New rabbi teacher is looking for disciples. If you're interested, please complete your application in triplicate and make an appointment to be interviewed, to see whether you're acceptable. <laughs> All he did was present his ministry, that's it. 
And then amongst those, he made a choice. Jesus did not choose the people who came to him and said, well, you know, I really feel that I should be one of your close disciples. Do you think you could choose me? I've had people come to me and say, I want you to mentor me, because that's all they know is mentorship. <laughs> I want you to teach me. I want you to train me. I want you to become my spiritual father. Jesus chose his disciples. And the master trainer will always choose from among those who come. Will choose those that they're going to pour all their time and energy into. And it's going to be a limited group, a select group of people. Now, Jesus chose these disciples from amongst those who were already following him. But he didn't choose everyone. He prayed all night before he made the decision, the 12 that he chose. Okay. And he was very specific about those that he chose. Now, here's something you need to know. Jesus didn't have this crowd of 1,000 people standing before him. And he went up and said, Father, which of the 12 out of this 1,000, where is the 12, Father? that I should choose. Jesus got a vision. And he saw Peter the above. Peter the fisherman said, oh, that's one of them. We often think that, don't we? Before Jesus called his 12, he knew exactly who they were. He'd already interacted with them. Okay. He already act reacted with them. He already knew them before he called them. When, when Jesus walked in there and said, Peter, Andrew, follow me. Have you ever wondered how these guys could suddenly, a stranger walks in there and says, follow me, and they drop their business and their dad and go running after him. How the heck did this happen? They knew who Jesus was already. He knew who they were already. You read through the gospel, you read a little bit more about how Jesus met them. And how it happened. Okay. When Jesus finally walked out and chose those 12, he'd already interacted with them and knew a bit about them. So don't come to a, a leader and pray that God will give him a vision in the night that you are called to be the disciple. <laughs> you better show some fruit. Because they were all followers. They were all disciples in a broad sense. They could all have been chosen, but Jesus only selected 12 that were specifically qualified. And actually, even amongst those 12, he had three who were in a closer inner circle that he worked even more intimately with later. Okay. Now, although Jesus didn't require anything really from his crowd of followers, except that they receive and are open, to his ministry. When he came to choose his disciples, there was a price that they had to pay. There was a price. If they failed to pay that price, they could not receive his training. And Jesus walked in there and said, Peter, follow me. If Peter said, well, you know, can I just chat it over with my folks a bit and discuss this? Can you, can you give me a few weeks? Jesus would have walked away and said, bye-bye, bye Peter, you're not one of the 12. Realize that when somebody offers you an opportunity, somebody who God has raised up to be a trainer, offers you an opportunity to become a disciple and to be trained under them, that opportunity may only be offered once and never again. And if you fail to embrace it, you may never enter into the blessing as you could have had. I've had many people who have come to me to require training in the past. They all come with different motives. There was a time when I was happy to receive anyone because I didn't have that many. And I realized that wasn't the Lord's way. 
And I began to say at a very high standard. And the Lord said to me, don't you receive anybody without testing them first. You set a very high standard. And if they cannot pass that test and maintain that standard, then they're not acceptable. Don't waste your time with them. I have in the past had those that I began training. And as training became intense, they began to falter and fail the tests. And there were times when the Lord said, they're not going to make it. Don't waste any more time on them. I never had to let them go. Say, I don't, you know, you can go somewhere else for training, but you'll not become an apostle under me. <laughs> that chance is gone now. Okay. The closer you get into this, the higher you go, the greater the price is going to become. And if you're not prepared to pay that price, I'm afraid you're not going to make it. Okay. So there was always something to give up. If they had a career, they had to let that career go. Peter and Andrew gave up their business. Matthew gave up his thriving job as a tax collector. <laughs> and if they were following someone else, they had to make a choice. Are you going to follow that person and have them teach you and train you? Or are you going to come under me? Well, you know, I, I would like to get the best of both worlds. So, you know, I will, I've enrolled in a course there and I'm under training with this person and, and, I, and I'd like to have your training as well. Bye-bye. So long. It's been good to know you. You can't have two trainers at the same time. Doesn't work. Jesus said no servant can serve two masters. Well, the disciple-master relationship is exactly the same. You have to make a choice. In John chapter 1, verse 35, we see a typical example of this. John 1, 35. John the Baptist said, baptized Jesus and proclaimed him to be the Son of God. And in John 1, 35, it says, again, the next day, John stood with two of his disciples. John was training people himself. He had disciples. And looking upon Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. I think one of those was Peter. They had to make a choice. Are we going to continue to follow John? He's been great. He's taught us a lot. We've really benefited from his training. But yeah, somebody has come who is offering us far more. We've kind of got up to John's level, but we're stuck on a plateau now. We need to go to the next level. You have to make a transition. You're going to have to leave the one and cleave to the other. So they came to Jesus and they said, Lord, uh, where do you live? <laughs> we read about that just further on, John chapter 1, verse 38. It says, then Jesus turned around and saw them following, said to them, what are you looking for? And they said to him, Rabbi, which being interpreted means master. <laughs> They're calling him master now. Where do you live? He said to them, come and see. And they came and saw where he lived. He invited them to his home. And they remained with him that day because it was about four o'clock in the afternoon. You said, come and see where I live. Come and see how I live. Come and see what is going to be involved if you decide to become one of my disciples. See, he didn't only teach them, he showed them. So I've got a great trainer. He really teaches good, giving me some good principles. Have you seen how he lives? Have you been to his home? Have you seen what he's like with his family? Have you seen what he's like when things are not going well? When he gets out of bed in the morning on the wrong side? Have you? Well, you know, most leaders wouldn't have the guts to invite somebody to come and see them. You look great behind the pulpit. Great man of God, it is anointed, got such a knowledge of the word. 
but he fights with his wife every day. You don't see that. We want to follow him because of what we see behind the pulpit. No, Jesus offered them a model that they could follow. And they became his family. They lived with him. They worked with him. They socialized with him. They received from him every single day, directly. How did he train them? Well, firstly, he taught them. They'd go with him and watch him preach. And afterwards, they bombard him with questions. So, hey, we didn't fully understand your preach. Can you explain it to us? And he gave them the inside story, the background details, the stuff that he wouldn't share with the public. Explained it all to them. Hey, Lord, we don't understand this parable that you gave. It's confused us. It's quite simple, guys. Let me explain it to you. This is what's meant by the parable. Oh, now we get it. See, that privilege is not available to the public. They only got the parable. The disciples got the real thing. See. They watched him preach. They watched him pray. They watched him as he ministered healing. They watched him as he performed miracles. They had very clear pictures in their mind of how they should operate if they were to be like Jesus. And then he tested them. <laughs> oh, there's always the test. Here's one which specifically says he tested them. In John chapter 6 and verse 5, they had all these people following. And it is now late in the day. It says, then Jesus lifted up his eyes and saw a great company coming to him. And he said to Philip, where will we buy bread that these people may eat? And it says, and he said this to test him. For he himself knew what he intended to do. Come on, Philip. You've watched me perform miracles. You've heard my teachings on faiths. Here's a test for you, Philip. We've got all these people. We need to give them something to eat. And Philip went all natural and analytical. Well, we're going to need so much money to buy so much food. See, Jesus had taught them faith, and he tested to see where they got it. Hmm? And when they went across the sea in the storm, he's just giving them some good, powerful preaching. And they got in the boat, and he went and fell asleep at the back of the ship. And the storm came. Oh, and they're rowing, and they're struggling, and they're crying, going, Lord, Lord, help us, we're going to drown. And he just came up and said, quiet sea. He said, what's wrong with you guys? Where's the faith? Where's your faith? <laughs> Expect to get tested. Expect to be corrected when you fail. Because that's part of your training. Well, we don't like that, do we? We don't like people tell us where we failed. We don't like people pointing out our faults and our failures. You want to go to the top? You better be ready for that. Because it's part of your training. It gave them practical experience. After he taught them, he sent them out in twos to go out and do some of the things that he'd been doing. Gave them a touch of his anointing. Gave them a chance to put into practice what they've been learning. And later on, actually, they kind of took over some of their job from him. Jesus was, he couldn't pray with everybody. He was exhausting him. The disciples would pray for the sick and heal them and do all the stuff. Only when they flunked it, like... <laughs> They tried to cast the demon out, wouldn't come out. Lord, Lord, help us, <laughs> Lord. <laughs> and Jesus came and said, come out. <laughs> there it goes. Oh, but we thought we could do that, Lord. <laughs> Why did we fail? He said, because you've got no faith. Correction. Okay. Now, when Jesus finally was finished and he, it was time for him to leave, he could now take those disciples and commission them and give them a task to do. He was no longer going to be physically present. He was only going to be present through the Holy Spirit that he was going to send. But now they could step in and take his place on this earth to be what he was, what he showed them to be. And that's the whole goal of being trained. 
is that eventually you can replace your trainer. Go out there into your own ministry. And he'll still be there to help you. By that time, he's probably a spiritual apostolic father. Can help you. But you're going to move out into your own ministry and just do what you saw him do. In your own right. In your own ministry. Jesus said to them in John 20, in verse 21, says, Jesus told them again, peace to you. Just as my father has sent me, in the same way now I'm sending you out. When the disciple has been fully trained, the master's not going to hang on to them. He's going to send them out. And after Jesus did that, he collected another 70 and sent them out. He only just started with the 12. On the day of Pentecost, there were 120. The numbers got bigger. If you've been selected to be amongst a small group of disciples under a trainer, consider yourself privileged because you're getting personal attention. When that trainer becomes famous and gets busy, you might have to make an appointment to see him. Sometimes we take things for granted and we think because something's free that it's not a value. Value the opportunity that's offered to you. So in conclusion, Jesus gave us a perfect model for how ministries should be trained. And if we follow his model, we can accomplish what he did. But there's a price to pay. Disciples must be prepared to pay the price. And the trainer has an even bigger price to pay. You know what it's like having a bunch of people living with you? Watching your every move. Looking to you as a model so you can't fail. It's not easy. But that's how Jesus trained his disciples. Very early in our ministry experience, shortly after Daphne and I were married, God began to bring people to us who lived with us, and we trained them in the home. That's kind of continued, and we still have people with us. <laughs> We've had very few times when we were alone. There was always somebody there being trained. See, and that training isn't just about the meetings and the lectures. You're there sharing all the time. You're there giving a model to show them how you handle. So what happens if you have a fight with your wife? Let them see it and show them how you resolve it. Best way you can train them. Don't give them a whole nice big lecture on how to solve marital problems. How do you do it? Show us. It's a challenge. So you want to be trainers. You think it's going to be all glory? Yeah. I'm going to be the great apostolic trainer. Everybody going to look to me. You prepared to have people come live in your home? Eat meals with you? Sit with you when you socialize? Go everywhere with you? You never have time alone? You've got to fight to get time alone? You may have to pay that price. God may lead you differently. For me, I was prepared to pay that price from the beginning, and I still do. And we still keep inviting people into our home, and they come for a season, and then they leave. The ultimate pattern is the setting up of a ministry center where people can come stay for an extended period and receive hands-on training. And we'll be teaching a lot more about that, especially in the apostolic school, because the apostles... Usually, apostolic couples set up ministry centers. And from there, everything will take place. Okay, so how can we do this practically? Because we're not at Jesus' level, are we? You know, how can we accomplish what he did? Is it possible? Well, how did some of the early leaders and the early apostles accomplish it? in the early church. That's what I plan to teach in our next lecture. 
And I'll be going to that in detail, and I'll show you how some of the apostles of the New Testament, how they trained and the methods they used to build the new church. And then after that, we're going to look at how we do it in the 21st century. We're going to show you how God's led us to do it, how he's teaching us to do it, how we can accomplish the same thing and raise up the leaders for the new church that God is beginning to build. Would you like to be part of that? Well, your starting point is, are you prepared to pay the price? The Lord said, nobody does anything without counting the cost first. So count the cost. And if you're prepared to pay the price to be trained, and then once you're trained, are you prepared to pay the, the price to become the trainer and to do the same thing? If you are willing, the sky's the limit. Well, I'm not really called to be a trainer. Do you want to be a trainer? Do you have a passion in your heart to be a leader in the kingdom of God? Oh, I'd love to be a leader, but I'm not really called. You know, many years ago, in fact, Daphne and I just got married. We, we visited a little church while we were on honeymoon. And uh, the guy that met us at the door was so enthusiastic and on fire. I thought, man, they've got an awesome pastor. But as it progressed and the meeting came, the real pastor walked in. And he was a typical status quo pastor. His vision was only for his church and how great his church was going to be and the big meetings they were going to do and da 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 and would we like to come and join his church? And I thought, no, who's this guy we met at the beginning? And I discovered he was the deacon. Now, after the meeting, I went to go look for him. The Lord said, I've called that guy. I went to go look for him. I couldn't even, he was sitting in the bookshop working, doing his, faithfully doing his job as a deacon. And I realized why God had taken us to that church. And I finally got a chance to be alone with him. I said to him, Brother, the Lord shows me that he's placed his calling on your life. Would you like to go into ministry? He said, oh, I would love to. He said, but I'm not qualified. I'm just a deacon. Thus says the Lord. <laughs> I gave him a prophetic word and I walked out. I don't know where he is today. I hope you received that word and moved on. But you see, that's the old status quo pattern. We've got to fit into their rules and regulations, their training. Have you been to Bible school? Have you done this? Have you done that? See, God, God is not training the leaders of his new church that way. He's training them the way Jesus trained them, the way the early apostles trained them, and he's building a new church that's going to be far greater than the church even that existed in the days of the apostles. If you had a desire to be a leader and to rise up in that church, the opportunity will be there. All you need to do is show the desire and be prepared to pay the price and the willingness, and God will take you all the way to the top. It may take a little longer, but there's nothing to stop you reaching that goal. Father, I thank you for your word. I gave it as you gave it to me. I thank you for those who are listening today and those even who are listening to this again afterwards on the video, and I ask you to challenge and call and move upon the hearts of those who have a passion and a desire to be used by you and to rise up as leaders in your kingdom, Lord. And I ask you to call them and bring them in and train them up to lead this magnificent new church that you are building, that you are going to return for, Lord. And we all find our place and fulfill completely what you've called us to do. Thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.